This morning, the front of my head kept on lighting up with the word Victoria. That was because I was looking at my reflection in the train window as we waited at the station and I could see the departure strip behind. Now that I'm here, the inside of my head keeps lighting up with the words Patrick and Hamilton. Patrick Hamilton was a writer. He found fame in between the two world wars that came to define the last century. He was the chronicler of the dissolute, the despairing, the hopeless and the hopeful. And he is one of the gods of my idolatry. Beer bottles, beer glasses, pub tables, pub furniture, pub windows, pub signs. They're all indelibly stamped with Hamilton's take on them. And especially the door, opening and closing, as a new character enters and re-enters the stage, Hamilton's stage, complete with stage directions and detailed descriptions. Hamilton's trick is simple. It's the trick of all successful art. He embodies the time in which he writes and communicates it to us in the future. He also reminds us that although the pub decor may have changed, we have not. Hamilton's work projects the full horror of the monster pub ball. The repetitious, the self-deluded, the self-infatuated. Sleeping just before five on a dark October's afternoon, I had a singularly vivid and audible dream. I dreamed of the years that followed Patrick Hamilton's death, of James Bond, The Beatles, Doctor Who, and a thousand other quintessentially English institutions that we'll now never know what he thought of. I'd love to ask him, wouldn't you? In just the same way as I'd never realised that my bedroom was connected to Malvern Station, I didn't realise that you could get directly from Stourbridge bus garage in the 1970s onto Brighton Seafront. I'm from the future, which is funny because this is the past. How far in remote posterity you've unearthed these video scrolls, I don't know. But perhaps in 1900 years from now, I, Cummingsius, will be heard.
Like I said, I'm from the future, Patrick Hamilton's future. The future became permanent for Patrick Hamilton on September the 23rd, 1962, when he died in Sheringham, a little seaside town on the Norfolk coast. But it's the Sussex coast, and Brighton in particular, which holds his afterimage on its retina, fading like the world he documented, year by year, stripped of its flesh, like a skeleton out at sea. John Betjamin said, I think Patrick Hamilton is one of our finest novelists. Don't you just want to cuddle him? I mean, I want to cuddle John Betjamin. John Betjamin didn't say that he wanted to cuddle Patrick Hamilton. Well, he might have done, but I don't know that he said that. Know what I mean? Romany soothsayer predicted that I would find a purple and yellow crocheted tootle tie in a hole on the beach. I hope she's right. I can sense his fear of being swept away by the swell that we all glimpse through the chinks in the slats on the pier. Hamilton's work makes me ashamed of my lack of cynicism, even at my most cynical. So who do you think would have been Patrick Hamilton's favourite Beatle? Um, Pete Best. Quite right. There are, in truth, very few days when, on a darkened stage with a green front cloth, I do not see Mr. Prest appear to the delight of the children and the astonishment of Miss Roach. I'm always accompanying Ryan, Gorse and Bell on their sortie on the West Pier standing on the brink of adulthood and waiting for life to reveal itself. And I can't tell you how many times I've escorted and been escorted as far as the clock tower, hopeful and scared and double dealing and being dealt with doubly. talking about the need for pavilionisation. He thought that roads needed pavilionising, streets needed pavilionising, houses needed pavilionising, and even pavilions needed pavilionising. Do you know what? I'm beginning to think he was right all along. A 
I've just overheard two men saying people think it's the real thing, don't they? The real what? The real cottage in which you installed your mistress and then it grew in an elephantine manner into an enormous Indio Baroque structure. That must be it. I get a bit tetchy when Patrick Hamilton is described as one of England's minor novelists. For me, he deals with embarrassment, hope, relief, boredom, self-delusion, more even-handedly and beautifully than anyone else. Barring accidents, there's not much more to life, is there? If Patrick Hamilton had been young during Britpop, what do you think his favourite suede album would have been? Um, Dogman Star? You think so? Yeah. I think it would have been sci-fi lullabies. I was once in a junk shop in Cradley Heath, looking at some ties on a wall, next to which there was a little oil painting of a seaside scene. A little old man shoved his head over my shoulder and asked me a question that I can't repeat here. But I didn't have to answer, he answered for me. If you're not from the black country, you might have to think about his answer for a couple of minutes. What he said was, say side aid. Boats will be seats and seats will be boats. It's a mixed up, muddled up, shook up world. All a bit Wallacey Kandinsky, isn't it? Whenever I visit a model village, the first thing I look for is the model of the model village. Then the eye travels a short distance to find the model of the model of the model village, and then on to the model of the model of the model of the model village. But that's as far as you can ever see. And the future's like that. It's a little version of now, distorted and distant, and eventually lost to sight. If Patrick Hamilton had lived for another 13 months, Doctor Who would have started. Who do you think his favourite Doctor would have been? Colin Baker. Don't you think he'd have been a bit of a purist and been unable to accept anyone after Hartnell? Yeah. So again, if Patrick Hamilton had been a young man during Britpop, what do you think would have been his favourite obscure 90s indie band? Ah, uh, well, Kingmaker? 
be hauteur, surely. Often, my dreams are like this. Patrick Hamilton's favourite Bond would be? Uh, Timothy Dalton. Yeah, I think you're right. scenes in Art Deco stained glass portals, wedding cake, nouveau, seaside glam cathedral towers, 30 cinema torches, a bit of Indian restaurant and 70 spare bedroom thrown in for good measure. I never realised how brilliant this building was before. For there is this about men, you can embitter and torment them from birth, you can make them waiters and sailors when they want to be authors. You can make them servants of their passion, weak, timorous, valueless, vain, egotistic, puny and afraid. Then having made them so, you can trick them and mock them with all the implements of fate. Lead them on, only to betray them. Obsess them with hopeless dreams, punish them with senseless accidents, and harass them with wretched fears. You can buffet them, bait them, enrage them, and load upon them all of the evils and follies in this veil of obstruction and tears. You can never make them do any provocation. So he died. And therein lies their acquittal. Speaking of which, if Patrick Hamilton had been a young man during the English Civil War, do you think he'd have been a, a royalist or a parliamentarian? But surely that would depend on uh, various socio-political factors, uh, things entirely beyond his control and of which we can have no understanding. Makes me feel like Charlton Heston at the end of Planet of the Apes as well, but then almost everything does. You know what I mean? Not much.
much has changed since Ernest Ralph Gorse sent those threatening letters to Overstreet. Nor since William Hartnell's brilliantined hair fell forward as Richard Attenborough hurled himself from the pier. Brighton remains what it always was, something old, something new, something ultramarine, something white. London by the sea, England washed by the waves of the past. God, I feel English. Thank mm -hmm. you.